It's our great blessing that Brother Joseph has come to teach us about Therese. He has done that for us before when he worked at Sangre. Probably many of you met him when he was a spiritual director at Sangre de Cristo Retreat Center outside of town. And for the last four years, he's been in Kenya where he has been teaching on prayer and on St. Therese. So during that time, he's been teaching and counseling and doing spiritual direction. And now he's going to be able to share uh, this deep spirituality with you. Two of the books that he's written about St. Therese are magnificent. The one about um, the encounter with her is in its eighth printing. People just keep buying it up. Which little housekeeping detail? We have some here. Right? And the new book is going to be, I think, an even greater seller. Because of all the dozen books on St. Therese that I have read, Brother Joseph wrote the best. So with all those nice tantalizing remarks, let us proceed to Brother Joseph. Well, good evening, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for being with us this evening and your interest in uh, Therese of Lisieux and her spirituality. Uh, I'm going to refer to the little flower as we had come to know her and or Teresa of the Child Jesus as Therese, which is the name that her French name and is being used more and more now, Therese of Lisieux. She uh, is, had been called the Little Teresa because there was a big Teresa, Teresa of Avila. But uh, she's now being referred to more and more as Therese of Lisieux, the great saint in her own right. Therese, as you know, died at the age of 24 and her life was uh, filled with small things. She was not the great Saint Teresa. She didn't have apparitions or special prayer experiences. She didn't found a religious order. She didn't die for the faith. She didn't uh, have the great uh, revelations. But she lived a common life a very simple life, and in doing so, began to teach us and the church a new idea of what it was to be holy. Because up until her time, it was usually thought that to be holy required some great dimension to our life, something special. But holiness, she began to teach us, was for everyone. Holiness, we are all called to be saints. We are all called to be holy, and we can be holy in our ordinary life. That holiness consists not in great spiritual devotions or revelations or great spiritual uh, uh, kinds of uh, apparitions or but rather holiness consists, as Jesus talks about it, in great love and in great uh, adherence and in fidelity to God's will in our life as God's will unfolds in the daily activities of our life. So from the beginning of her life, Therese's desire was to be a loving person. And that's what we're going to focus on in these three sessions, tonight, tomorrow, and Tuesday. What she understood about love and how she began to, from the beginning, 
live a life of love. But the life of love that she lived as the life of love that we live is developmental. That is, we do not know how to live a life of love at the beginning. And gradually, we learn how to love. Now, love in the English language is a very peculiar word because it is applied to so many different things. I mean, on the one hand, we love God. And on the other hand, we love a good meal. See, and on one hand, we love our parents. And on the other hand, we love teddy bears. And on one hand, we love uh, uh, the, the weather. And on the other hand, we love our siblings. We apply the word love to a great number of things. And we wonder, how, what, what, what does it mean then to speak of living love or living a life of love? Well, what Therese came to understand, and that we will kind of explore these days, is that the common element when we use the word love, the minimum of love, means that the relationship we have between ourselves and what we refer to as love, what we love, that relationship is not adversarial. That is, we are not in a relationship in which we are the enemy of what we say we love. Now that is a, an important idea because what it means is that love in the biblical sense and in the sense that Jesus uses it when he speaks about loving enemies as well as loving God, means that it's not dependent only on our intellect, but it's dependent on our feelings. And the feelings and the intellect need to be modified in such a way that we do not feel and cultivate the feelings of being an enemy to people or to things. In other words, we separate love and violence. So Therese speaks of implicitly, not explicitly in her autobiography, Story of a Soul, but implicitly she speaks of and teaches us how to love without violence. So when we're speaking of love without violence, we're not referring to violence in a political sense, nonviolence in a political sense, or nonviolence just in the sense of outward physical violence. We're talking about not, at, not cultivating feelings or thoughts of violence. Because cultivating feelings and thoughts of violence poison our heart. And we cannot love if we have the poison of the feelings and the thoughts of violence within us. And all we need to do is think for a moment about how often we have thoughts and feelings of being adversarial or violent toward other things, other people, other experiences. In other words, to love from Therese's points of view means to cultivate feelings and thoughts which are not feelings and thoughts of being an enemy of anybody or anything. And then we can begin to really love. 
Now this was something that t- took a lifetime for Therese to understand. Tonight, we will focus on one particular aspect of this understanding of Therese's notion of love without violence. And it begins at the very beginning of her life. When Therese was three months old, her mother almost lost her because her mother could not breastfeed Therese. Therese's mother had cancer and had lost three other children previously, and she almost lost Therese. The doctor told Therese's mother that the only way Therese could survive was if her mother gave Therese to a wet nurse who could nurse Therese back to life. So at the age of three months, Therese was given away to Rose Taillé. And for the next 12 months, Rose Taillé took care of Therese. Now this is not in Therese's autobiography because she did not know or remember this intellectually but she remembered it in her imagination and she remembered it in her feelings because children, even at the age of three, have feelings and have imagination. And what she was experiencing in those months, those 12 months that she was away from her mother, we begin to see unfold in her autobiography as she recounts what took place when she returned after she was 15 months old and she returned back to her mother. And her mother wrote letters describing Therese's behavior and she wrote these letters to Therese's older sister, Pauline, who was in boarding school. And Therese quotes these letters in her autobiography. And the letters go something like this. Dear Pauline, Therese now has returned home. And she is so strong and beautiful. She is very, very intelligent. And she's very willful. In fact, Pauline, She's much more intelligent than you were when you were her age. She's a beautiful child, but she never wants to be out of my sight. She always is underfoot. She's always trying to get my attention. Now you be good at school, Pauline, and continue to study. Love, mother. Now, a few weeks later, Therese's mother writes another letter to Pauline, and it goes something like this. Dear Pauline, Therese is even getting stronger, and she's even getting more and more bright. She's very intelligent, and she always wants to be with me. She is, in fact, getting involved, she's getting involved with me in such a way that it's hard for me to continue my work. She never wants to be out of my sight. She's trying to climb the steps now, and she can't go up by herself, so she yells and screams until I come over. And then, when I'm with her, she calms down, and I can help her up the next step. But she always wants to be with me. Now, it doesn't take a great psychologist to know what is happening with Therese. She has returned from 12 months of being with 
Rose Taille to her real mother. And what, Therese, what is happening to, Re, to Therese is that she doesn't want to lose her mother again. She wants to get close to her mother. That the bonding with her mother needs to be secure. That the feelings of separation that she had as a little child are very, very distressful for Therese. Now, Therese does not know this at an intellectual level. But she feels this way. Children have feelings from the very beginning. And the feelings of being separated from her mother are very, very strong in Therese. And she doesn't want to have those feelings. So she wants to be close to her mother. So now what Therese does, and it becomes clear in her autobiography as she continues to write about herself and especially the description that her mother gives her in the letters that she continues to write, that Therese wants to be close to her mother and to get close to her mother, she wants to please her mother and she wants to get close to Pauline and Marie and Leonie and Celine, her older sisters, and to get close to them, she wants to please them. And so she begins to develop the side of herself that pleases people. Now, describing herself in her autobiography, she talks about the fact that God gave her a very loving personality and a great capacity to please people. So she begins to use this gift that she has in an excessive way. And she wants to please people so that she will be close to them, so that she'll never lose them again. But she does lose her mother. And she loses her mother when she's four years old. Her mother dies. So now she's lost Rose Taille, who took care of her for those first 12 months. Then she loses her real mother. And then she rushes toward Pauline, her older sister, who comes back from boarding school and says, Pauline will be my mother. Because she wants to be close to a mother. She now also begins to get closer to her father, and her father becomes her king, and she becomes his little queen. And that relationship develops for the next 10 years. That relationship with her father, whom she describes as not only having the love of a father, but also the love of a mother, compensates now for the loss that she had and relieves the feelings of the death of her mother. She gets close to her sisters. She gets close to her father. Meanwhile, she begins to develop a spirituality in which she wants to love God in everything. And so she begins to practice, as she says, little virtues to please God. But meanwhile, because of the death of her mother, she goes into what would now be diagnosed as a mild depression. And she speaks of this in her autobiography. She says, I lost the joy and delight of my childhood at, my de at the death of my mother. And for 10 years, 
I was... I, I lost the capacity to manage my feelings because I would cry every time I did something wrong or people didn't like what I was doing. I would cry. And then when I stopped crying, I would cry because I had cried. She says in her autobiography, I wanted to do everything for God, but when I would do something for my sisters and they didn't notice, then I would begin to cry. She would say, that's a strange way of practicing virtue. So by the age of 13, she began to notice that she was being pushed around by excessive feelings. And she was practicing virtue in a strange way. She was beginning to understand by the age of 13 that even though intellectually she wanted to please God in everything, that as St. Paul discovered, we can have mixed motives. Or as Jesus said, we can honor God with our lips, but our hearts can be far away. And St. Paul says we can have faith that moves mountains. But with mixed motives that destroy love, authentic love, it's all for nothing. At the age of 13, she began to notice that her motivation was not as pure as she wished it to be. And the reason was because she was pushed around by feelings. The feelings of needing to please people. And she thought she was practicing virtue, whereas really she was just satisfying herself. And now she says, I, if I was to grow up and become the strong person that I needed to be in order to enter karma, it would require a miracle it would require a miracle. She said, for because for 10 years, I've been trying to kind of fix myself up and purify my motives. And then she says, but this miracle happened on Christmas night. And she said, it was the miracle of my complete conversion. Now this she recounts in just two pages of her autobiography, but she calls it a complete conversion. And 20 years or 14 years later, when she's describing this, she refers to it again as the complete conversion. And some biographers trivialize this and say, well, what was she being converted from? She wasn't a Protestant that had to be converted to be a Catholic. And she wasn't like St. Augustine that was, in, that was in deep sin and needed to be converted out of sin. What was she converted from? Well, she was converted from being on one path to another path in which her motives now were more and more for God and not just to satisfy herself and to take care of these difficult feelings that she was having and to please others in order to feel close to them. And that complete conversion 
she describes as very simple. I was coming back, she said, with Celine and her father from midnight mass, and I had just received the Eucharist. And Jesus in communion made me strong, and he enlightened my heart to see. And I was coming into the house, and it was the custom in those days to have, we have stockings at the fireplace, they had little shoes at the fireplace where the goodies were. But Celine had ritualized this for the sake of their father, so that when they returned from midnight mass every Christmas, they would go through this little ritual And Therese, who was the youngest of the family, would delight her father by pretending that she still believed in Santa Claus. And now she was 13 years old. And it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and her father was tired and irritated, and her father turned to Celine as this ritual was beginning to unfold and Therese was going to act like a little baby trying to pretend to believe in Santa Claus so as to go through this this play acting of that was supposed to amuse their father on Christmas night And Paul and uh, Therese was going upstairs to put her coat and hat away, and her father turned to Celine and said, "Well, Celine, thank God this is going to be the last year for this. Isn't Therese getting a little too old for this?" And Therese heard these words. Her father had no intention of having Therese hear them, but Therese overheard them. She was going up the steps, and she said, these words pierce my heart. She had been a complete failure in trying to please her father on this Christmas night. She had been a complete failure. Celine, seeing what happened, knew that Therese was just gonna burst into tears as she always did. Therese went up the steps. Celine ran up after her and said, don't go down now. You'll ruin everything. You'll just be crying and ruining everything. Therese put her hat and coat on the bed, ignored ignored Celine's advice, turned around, came down the steps, and said in her autobiography, I came down those steps and I was a new person. I was a new person. That comment, pierced her heart, but it also transformed her life because she saw through the enlightenment that she had received, she said, from Jesus in the Eucharist, she saw that she had been on the path of trying to please people at the expense of her own integrity that it was a false path, that she was not practicing virtue for the right reason, that it was true she was pretending. She came down the steps. She did not blame her father, which which would have been a form of retaliation and so a kind of violence. She did not blame herself, 
which would also have been a subtle form of violence. She came down the steps and she went through the ritual, but now she went through it with an inner freedom and a creative expression that was really an expression of love for her father. This was authentic love. It wasn't pretending love, nor was it love in order to make her father get close to her for her sake. It was love for her father's sake, to make him now come out of his feeling of sadness and his feeling of tiredness on this Christmas Eve. But that conversion moved Therese from a path of doing violence to herself by trying to live a life that was false by pleasing others to a life that was authentic to her own integrity. And she said, in a moment, I grew up in a moment, I grew up and regained my childhood character that I had lost when my mother died. Now she was a mature woman, and she said, now I was strong enough to enter karma. That conversion is an experience, I think, of Therese's beginning to understand that authentic love requires not only a love of God and a love of others, but it requires a love of ourselves. We have to be authentic to ourselves. There's nothing wrong with pleasing other people, but there's a lot wrong if we please other people at the expense of our own integrity and our own self-care. And Therese began to understand that. It took the rest of her life to work out the details of that. But she began to understand that if we are really going to love others, we need to love ourselves just as Jesus said, that we love God and we love others as we love ourselves, that it all goes together, that we cannot be doing violence to ourselves by compromising our own integrity and trying to please people in order to take care of those feelings that we have of loneliness, or the feelings we have of separation. Or for many of us, it might be something different. We cannot do violence to ourselves by trying to be a success in order to take care of those feelings we have of never wanting to be a failure. Or we cannot do violence to ourselves by struggling to be perfect in order to take care of those feelings we have of guilt when we do something wrong. In other words, we have to come back to ourselves and begin to look at our motivations and to respect our limitations and to respect our gifts and not be pushed around and controlled by our feelings, whatever they are. The feelings of wanting to be a success, the feelings of wanting to, to, be, to be noticed, the feelings of wanting to be um, perfect, the feelings of wanting to be close to people. All of those are good feelings. But if they control us, and if they don't let us become ourselves, the people that God wants us to be, 
if they undermine our own integrity and cause us to be living a false life or on the wrong path, then we are not loving other people, we're not loving God, and we're really not loving ourselves. We are what St. Paul says, ending up doing what we didn't want to do and not doing what we really do want to do. So when St. Paul describes love, he says that it is patient and kind. And we really need to apply that to the love of ourselves. We really need to be patient and kind with ourselves. And if we discover that we're on the wrong path, that we are stumbling along, trying to, to do things not only to please God, but to make an impression on other people, or not only to, to uh, fulfill what we think is God's will in our life, but also to, to make a name for ourselves. If we find ourselves stumbling along that way, then we have to realize that that path requires us to be patient with ourselves and kind with ourselves as we move back on the right path. Because we cannot change that path with more violence. So Therese has some terrific spiritual and psychological advice that Bill will share with us. Those papers, ta-da, yeah. <laughs> so why don't we just stand up for a quick five minute break. Is it short enough that we could write it? <laughs> yes, let me dictate it to you, if you want to. This is, she gives two pieces of advice. The first piece of advice is, if you are willing to bear serenely the trial of being displeasing to yourself, then you will be for Jesus a pleasant place of shelter. If you are willing to bear serene the trial of being displeasing to yourself, when was the last time you were displeasing to yourself? And what was the occasion for your being displeasing to yourself? Were you displeasing to yourself because you were not perfect? Were you displeasing to yourself because you felt angry with somebody? Were you displeasing to yourself because you, didn't be, you weren't a success? And what did you do when you were displeasing to yourself? Did you get angry with yourself? Did you become impatient with yourself because you were impatient with somebody else? Did you become discouraged with yourself because you were a failure? Did you become distressed about being distressed? Did you become anxious about being anxious? You see, all of that is a subtle form of violence to yourself. Can we bear serenely the trial the pain of being a failure. Can we bear serenely the trial of being unsuccessful? Can we be patient with ourselves when we are not successful? That's a form of beginning to love ourselves. 
And part of Teresa's little way that you've heard about so much is not just doing little things with love. It's in particular loving the weaknesses of ourselves or rather loving ourselves in our weaknesses. To bear serenely the trial of being displeasing to ourself. Now the passage on prayer is how you go about doing that. And that passage is, for me, prayer is a surge of the heart. It is a simple look turned toward heaven. It is a cry of recognition and of love embracing trials and joys. It's a prayer is a cry of recognition and love embracing trials and joys. The trials and joys that we embrace in our prayer are the trials and joys of our life, especially the trials and joys of living a life that is not as perfect as we would like it to be, that is not as successful as we would like it to be. Now, Therese begins to understand this when she's 13 years old. It takes the rest of her life to fully grasp it. And that's what she begins to grasp more fully when she enters Carmel and sees that being impatient with oneself and not bearing the trials of our own life in patience not being patient with ourselves is the characteristic of many of the nuns in the Carmelite that she's living with. And it's causing not only distress in their own lives, but it's causing distress in the whole community. In other words, the inability, as St. Paul says, to be patient and kind subverts our ability to love. It subverts our ability to love because it injects violence into our relationships. Let's just take a moment. Do you want to just share with the person next to you for a moment and then we'll have any kind of questions or comments because we just have about five minutes left. So why don't you just share with one another, is there anything that's striking you that perhaps you would just like to share with your neighbor? And then we'll take any questions before we stop. Right. <clears throat> well, my question for you is, do you remember when I mentioned that Teresa's mother was writing to Pauline and said that she's smarter than you were when you were, ter when you were her age, and everyone laughed. Why did we laugh at that? Pauline may be getting resentful. Well, that would be the effect of what was being written. But why did, were we writing, why were we laughing at what was written? It's so obviously hurtful. Yeah, it's, it's obvious to us today that that kind of language is violent. Right? Now, where is that obviousness coming from? That was not obvious 50 years ago. And it wasn't obvious to Therese's mother, and Therese's mother lived just 100 years ago. Why is it obvious today? Because we're becoming more sensitive to the realization that love does not contain violence. And we're becoming more sensitive to the fact that violence is just not 
physical violence of killing people. There is an emotional violence that we perpetrate on other people, but we still need to know there's a, that there is an emotional violence that we do to ourselves. We don't have that quite as clear. And we need to think about that much more clearly. The emotional violence that we do to ourselves by trying to bully ourselves. Because was, Therese was not only more intelligent than Pauline, but Therese was more willful than Pauline. Therese could have been a little bully just like each of us is a little bully. And frequently we bully ourselves and we try to bully ourselves into virtue. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. Tomorrow we'll focus on Therese's understanding of not so much only love of ourselves, but love of others as she enters now Carmel. And on Tuesday, we'll talk about how Therese engaged the violence that was in the spirituality of the times that the Pope mentions when he, John Paul II, makes Therese a doctor of the church in 1997, he says that Therese has begun to help the church heal itself of Jansenism. And Jansenism is the harshness of the spirituality of Therese's time that still lingers in our time. Let's end there, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow night as well. Okay. Good night.